Ladies and gentlemen, hello. On behalf of Passaporta, I wish to welcome you to this literary meeting. We are delighted to once more welcome David Van here today. I say once more because the writer was in residence at Passaporta in the autumn of 17, where he worked, in part, on his new book, Halibut on the Moon. David Van will talk about his work with Cathy Matthijs, while Johan Blanc will read a few extracts from Halibut on the Moon. The reading will be in French, but the original and the Dutch translations will be screened so that we can all follow. After the meeting, David Van will be available to sign books. Before we begin, could you please check that your phones are on silent mode? I wish you a pleasant meeting. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, afternoon with uh, David Van. Uh, David, we're here to celebrate the release of your new novel, Halibut on the Moon. There's also a Dutch and a French edition of the book. And, you know, as, as we were saying before, I met you 10 years ago um, in, in California when your, well, your Legend of a Suicide was published. And I think I remember from the interview that you said, I'm going to write a couple of books about my family and then I'm going to do something else. And actually, this is also what you did. You, you started writing other novels. But this book is again about well, the last days of Jim Van, who's inspired by your father, who committed suicide. So my obvious first question is, why return to this material? Why did you write about this again? Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Passaporta. Uh, they were so kind to me. Uh, it was a wonderful residency for a couple months, a great apartment here in Brussels and getting to know the place. And um, it's great to be back. I'm very happy to be back. Um, and, and thank you for interviewing me again 10 years later. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like the first might have been punishment enough. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I, and I was told to stop writing about my father. Um, clear back when I was writing the first book, when I was in university uh, at Stanford, um, I had written about him in several classes, creative writing classes, and everyone told me to stop and move on to something else. And that was only at the very beginning of 10 years of trying to write about him for the first book, Legend of a Suicide. Uh, and then I did kind of stay away from him as I wrote other books, but it's the central event of my life. It's the most important moment. So it's, it creeps into other stories. So he's referenced in other books. There'll you know, be some reference to the father or something. It's hard to get completely away from him. And I had never uh, told uh, a novel or a memoir uh, about his life, especially the end of his life, which would try to get close to his despair and trying to understand uh, what happened. Um, so that felt unfinished. Uh, Suquan Island, within Legend of a Suicide, takes a very different direction halfway through. The book has a big shock in the middle of it and goes a completely different direction and didn't end up exploring about my father what I had thought that I would explore. I'm so not used to not having a French translation after I speak. <laughs> it's strange that I'll just keep going on because I came from France <laughs> before mm. this. Um, so anyway, but does that just mean... feel perplex. <laughs> 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 but, does that mean that, the, that this book is then closer to what really happened? Yes, this book is, is uh, closer to what happened, um, but it's fiction uh, because I was 13 years old then. And I didn't understand a lot that was going on among the adults in my family. I wasn't there for their conversations. And also, I've lost my father to a large degree. It's been 39 years now, so it's very hard to recover him. Um, it, I, have, I remember him more from photos now than from real life, uh, which is a sad thing when that happens. I stopped seeing him in motion in my memories. Um, he's starting to become still photos. Um, but the, there were two specific reasons that I wrote this book, um, uh, and I talk about them in an author's note that I have in the book. Um, so one was that my stepmother, I saw her when I was on tour for Aquarium in 2015, and uh, she said that she was with my father right at the very end and had sex with him. And this was something I didn't know, no one in the family knew. Uh, my dad's whole family blames her for his suicide. Uh, which is not fair at all. He broke up their marriage. It was really his fault, everything. He wanted to be back together with her at the end. And as can happen, he focused all of his despair on her. He made it all about her in the end, and he killed himself while talking on the phone with her. So she had to hear, you know, 
she can't even answer a phone to that side of her head anymore because she could hear the blast and then hear parts of his head like falling, dripping from the ceiling. I mean, a horrible, horrible kind of moment. Um, and she really didn't deserve that, obviously. And it's terrible that my family blamed her also in addition. So I'm not trying to blame her, but I do think it was very bad for him to have sex with her and be with her right at the end uh, when he was feeling so much despair so that he'd have one moment with her but can't be with her. She's with another guy and, and moving on. Um, but what was frightening about that event when they got together is that he brought in his toiletries bag, you know, shaving kit and such, but it was very heavy, and she saw that his 44 Magnum pistol was in there. And she immediately, when she saw it, she knew that it was for her, that he was planning to kill her first and then kill himself. She was sure of that. And that was because she had just lost her parents less than a year before to murder-suicide. Her mother had uh, shot her husband with a shotgun and killed him, and then shot herself with a pistol. Um, this is what we do in small American towns. You should come visit. <laughs> come on down. This is going to be really nice. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, my, my family, they've been so great for a writer. We have five suicides and a murder. It's like great material. You know? I don't have to even think about anyone else's family or the wider world, which is, again, American. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, this moment... Uh, of thinking of her seeing the pistol and thinking it's for her was so disturbing for me. Um, I'd never, I wrote a book about a school shooting where killing other students at a university was part of the shooter's suicide. I wrote about him as a suicide. So I understood that that could happen, but I never thought about that for my father. So I just kept thinking of that scene. And the whole book is born of that scene, basically. Uh, that's been true for several of my books. For uh, for um, Caribou Island, uh, Désolation, uh, that was a, a, a scene of the main character, Irene, walking out across the frozen lake and, and wondering if the ice is thick enough to walk on. So she bends down and she brushes the snow off the ice to see how deep. But when she looks in, it's just black and she can't tell how deep. It's like a thousand foot deep lake, so you can't tell. And uh, she realized that was like looking into 30 years of marriage, like 30 years of marriage has become nothing. And that was a scene that just captured my imagination. And so the whole book was born of that. And that was true for this one also. Just one, one scene caused yeah. it. And then there was one other thing, sorry to go on forever, <laughs> um, which was the, uh, guilt. They, everyone feels guilty after a suicide. I, uh, my father asked me to spend a year back in Alaska with him. And I said no, and then soon after he killed himself. So I felt very guilty. I felt that if I said yes, my father would still be alive. Uh, and that's what Suquan Island was born out of. I, I imagined saying yes to spending that year, and then I wrote about what that year would have been like. Uh, and it's unfair that we feel guilty after a suicide uh, because we all live imperfect lives and we all could have done something different, but that didn't cause the suicide. Uh, so it's very unfair. And I don't want people who have suffered a suicide near them uh, to feel guilty. Uh, but after 35 years, my thinking changed a little bit. And I thought, well, if I'd said yes, he would have been alive at least a little longer. And if my uncle had gone to Alaska with him as planned and kept his gun and shells separate, and not been talked out of it at the airport, convinced by my father that he was fine, then maybe my father would have been alive longer. Um, we all failed him in one way or another at the end, not because we were bad people or intended to, but just because we were real people and we were afraid and, and nervous. And um, So it's an examination of all the small failures, why the trip to all the family at the end that was supposed to help him, why it didn't help him. And how does your family feel that you once again work with this material? Did you talk to them? Do you still talk to them? <laughs> uh, my uncle, my dad's brother, doesn't read my books. Um, uh, I think he's a total coward. Uh, but anyway, he doesn't read my books, uh, and that's his way of dealing with it. Uh, I do feel tremendously bad for him. He was depressed for at least 15 years after my dad's suicide and on medication, and we all deal with things however we can. And I love him, I'm close to him, I want to spend time with him, but I do think it's cow cowardly. It makes me admire him less, that he can't just read the words I wrote about my dad, like about his brother. Um, my grandmother, my, my father's mother, um, she lived to almost 100. Uh, she always encouraged me to write. She wanted me to write. 
Um, but she didn't know, of course, that I would end up writing about her son's suicide because uh, that hadn't happened yet. So uh, when she read the first short story I wrote, Ichthyology, she wrote me a letter. She said she cried for three days. It's too bad I grew up not respecting my father and I should turn to Jesus. Um, so it's literary criticism from the family. It's very helpful for revision. Um, <laughs> but I feel bad for them. Um, my mother is great. She read the book, and, and boy, she really understands exactly why I write, what I'm doing, why there are the transformations. Um, it's amazing that one of my parents, at least, completely understands and is supportive. So that's great. I even, she was even supportive after I wrote Dirt, which is about her family and her father beating her mother and f favoritism of, between her and her sister. And it's the walnut orchard and the house she grew up in. I used her, her nickname given to her by favorite aunt, Susie Q. And it's about the rage that my mother and I had at each other, how we didn't get along for years. And she even forgave me for that. I mean, I thought for sure she would never talk with me again. <laughs> Um, but the big test coming up is my next novel is about my sister. And uh, I don't know. She's not really prominent in this book. Yeah. She's she hasn't been prominent in any of the books because we always got along. Like, I've lived in New Zealand for 15 years, but I don't have a book about New Zealand because it was always nice there. Like, what am I supposed to write about? Uh, and my sister, too. We always got along fabulously. But then she was so enraged at my marriage, at my divorce. Um, uh, she has a really crappy marriage and is filled with rage every day at having raised twins alone for five years with her husband kind of not there. Um, so it has all the details of her crappy marriage and her rage at raising kids alone and her rage at my divorce. So I remember in real life it was so terrible to have her angry at me for the first time in my life. But part of me thought, huh, a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's possible. This is what, you know, uh, John Banville once told me, you either write books or you have family and friends. <laughs> yeah, but this is what he said. You agree, right? Yeah, and the thing is, I explained to my sister once, it was before the publication of, or after the publication of Dirt about my mother's family. She said, why don't you just not publish it? You know it would hurt our mom. Why do you publish it? And I had to explain, I care more about the books than I care about you or than I care about my wife, or our mom, or me. I don't care about me as much as I care about the books. Like, I'm happy to expose any shame and have people think whatever they want. Um, I just care about the books. Um, so it was, it was hard to explain that, but it's really true. I feel like my life is you know, kind of a, a joke and disaster. Like I, I keep doing, I'm really good at the repetitive mistake. I don't really learn from my mistakes. I just do them again, and I mean, there's, there's so little to recommend uh, about it. But the one thing I have is, is writing. Um, yeah. You know, a second chance to take these terrible family stories and turn them into something uh, that can be meaningful and coherent and even beautiful at moments. Yeah. Okay, we're going to listen to a first section um, from the book, which is will be read by Johan Blanc in French. So this is uh, actually the part where... Uh, so uh, Jim Van comes back from Alaska to California and he, he spends a couple of days there, and one of the uh, families, or he, he visits his ex-wife and the children, an, ol an old friend from school, but also his parents. And this is the <coughs> section where uh, Doug, so the brother, and Jim go and visit the parents. On est presque arrivé, dit Doug. Ferme-la maintenant. Tu peux jouer les cinglés avec moi, mais ne le fais pas avec papa et maman. Oui, chef. Des maisons en bordure de rivière et la leur apparaît soudain dans leur champ de vision. Une parcelle longue et étroite entourée d'une haie, une pelouse devant, la petite bâtisse blanche et rablée avec sa baie vitrée pour le petit déjeuner où son père est toujours assis, où il doit être assis en ce moment, son gros visage impassible tourné vers le lac immobile. Il roule dans l'allée. Longe les pensées et les pétunias que sa mère ne cesse de planter et le grenadier. Une entrée latérale en haut de marche rouge. Un grand garage à un étage où sont stockés une centaine de bois de serre suspendus à des poutres. La maison et le garage des lieux qui refusent d'être cantonnés à ce simple rôle, renfermant trop de temps et trop de souvenirs. J'ai l'impression que mon cerveau va exploser avec tous ces souvenirs, dit Jim. Pas de trucs comme ça. Lâche Doug. Tu ne leur dis pas des trucs comme ça. Je suis sérieux. Et qu'est-ce que je vais leur dire alors Je ne sais pas. Dis-leur que c'était agréable de voir tes enfants. Décris-leur Fairbanks à cette époque de l'année. Faites une partie de Pinocle et balance juste les banalités habituelles. 
Ah, ben voilà du concret, ça devrait me permettre de passer euh, quelques minutes. Le temps n'est pas une épreuve à traverser, ce n'est rien du tout. Contente-toi de vivre ta vie. Mais c'est justement ça, là. Ferme-la, sérieusement. Ouais, tu devrais devenir psy. Non, merci. Quelle perte immense pour le monde de la psychanalyse. Doug est déjà en haut des marches. Il ouvre la porte moustiquaire grinçante. Personne n'a jamais pris la peine d'enhuiler les gonds en 40 ans. Elle émet le même bruit depuis que Jim est gamin. Le revêtement inégal sous ses pieds, des fissures et les marches menacent de s'effriter. Des fourmis, partout, même en hiver. Il ne se souvient pourtant de leur présence qu'en été. La petite entrée comme un garde-manger adjacent à la cuisine, sa peinture jaune sans jamais la moindre utilité particulière. Et les haricots verts dans une casserole sur la gazinière où ils doivent être en train de cuire depuis des heures ou des jours. Rien que des haricots et de l'eau. Aucun effort pour y ajouter une saveur. Une bouillie liquide qu'on pourrait avaler sans même mâcher. Une nutrition directe. Les mêmes casseroles en inox que dans son enfance. La même gazinière. Rien ne change jamais ici. Le même lino vert foncé. Tout est oppressant. La longue cuisine étroite. Son père assis à l'autre bout près de la baie vitrée. Et sa mère... Fidèle à son poste, devant l'évier, les mains dans un torchon. « Salut, maman !» dit Jim, car le silence règne et ils semblent tous attendre. « Eh bien » dit-elle. « Ouais » dit-il. « C'est un bon résumé de la situation. » Les lèvres de sa mère pincées, l'inquiétude et tant de rides sur son visage à présent. Sa propre mère qui vieillit, alors il est là depuis bien assez longtemps. Ce n'est pas trop tôt, franchement. 39 ans, c'était un âge avancé dans l'ancien temps. « Comment tu vas, maman » demande-t-il en faisant un effort. Les lèvres de sa mère s'en trouvent. Elle incline la tête sur le côté en signe d'inquiétude et d'amour. « Oh, on va bien, » dit-elle. « On est occupé avec l'église pour Pâques. » Mais il ne sait pas quoi répondre à cela. Que doit-on répondre à rien du tout ?« Waouh !» dit-il enfin. « Vous vous y prenez tôt ?» Elle porte un vêtement bleu à motif fleuri, quelque chose qu'elle a depuis plusieurs décennies. On pourrait appeler ça une chemise, sauf qu'elle est trop épaisse et qu'elle descend trop bas et qu'elle est agrémentée d'une sorte de col à volant, presque comme à l'époque de Shakespeare. « Comment on appelle ce genre de vêtement » demande-t-il. D'une main, elle empoigne le tissu entre ses seins et semble inquiète. « Euh, juste un chemisier, je pense, » dit-elle. « Tu l'as, mais depuis tellement longtemps. »« Oui, je crois que mon crâne va se fendre en deux tellement rien n'a changé ici. »« Je pourrais avoir 15 ans, tout est exactement pareil. »« Tu es vieille maintenant, en plus, et, en plus, et plus grosse, et la peau de ton cou est flasque, mais sinon tu es presque identique. »« Tu as la même coiffure qu'à l'époque, sérieusement, la même coiffure qu'en 1955. »« Jim !» Elle le dit d'un ton sec et ferme. Un ton de réprimande. Elle se penche légèrement en arrière, comme pour essayer de voir son fils de loin. « Pardon, » dit Jim. Et il se demande pourquoi Doug n'a rien dit. Il n'est pas intervenu pour le plaquer au sol ou le faire taire. Son père se contente de regarder. Ses joues grasses de bulldog et son crâne chauve, quelques touffes blanches sur les côtés, des taches brunes sur une peau d'un marron rougeâtre. Main ballante, une posée sur le dossier d'une chaise, l'autre sur le bord de la table, des doigts épais comme des quartiers de pommes de terre restés trop longtemps en vitrine. « Alors, lâche Jim, t'as quelque chose à dire, papa ?»« Ne parle pas comme ça, » dit son père. « Ouais, » fait Jim, « ouais, et ce sera quoi de dire ça au juste ?» Euh, on s'est arrêté à Cloverdel sur la route, euh, intervient Doug. On a mangé un corn dog, mais on devrait avoir encore faim pour le déjeuner. On a fait la pause il y a un petit moment déjà. Bien, tant mieux, dit sa mère. Allez vous mettre à table, je vais apporter les plats. Et hey, papa, tu portes le même vêtement Un fin pull vert à fermeture éclair, tricoté assez serré, un appui de chasse pour un léger camouflage. Je ne sais pas comment ça s'appelle, ça non plus, continue Jim. C'est pas un pull, ni une veste, ni un suite. Comment tu appelles ça Ça suffit dit son père. « Ça fait si longtemps que tu es gros. Ça a commencé quand Parce que dans mes souvenirs d'enfance, tu as toujours étiré ce machin au niveau du ventre. Est-ce que c'est le même qu'avant ou alors tu en achètes un modèle identique encore et encore 
Doug lui a posé la main sur le bras. Un autre combat se profile, nécessaire, ici, dans la cuisine, au milieu des haricots trop cuits, au milieu des réserves dissimulées d'une centaine de pulls de chasse verts usés et d'une centaine de chemisiers bleus à motifs fleuris qui les enfouiraient totalement dans le gouffre qui s'ouvre sous eux en cet instant. Jim se voit tomber pour l'éternité, engoncé dans les vêtements de ses parents, dans une vision de naissance en quelque sorte, agitant les bras et les jambes. Mais Doug ne fait rien de plus. Il lui tient juste le bras, et étrangement, ce geste suffit à interrompre Jim, du moins temporairement, à cause de la vision. « Du camouflage dans la cuisine, » dit Jim, « parce qu'il ne faudrait pas que quelqu'un risque de te voir ici, hein. il faut que tu restes invisible. » Et son père fait exactement ça. Comme sur commande, il ne prononce pas le moindre mot, il ne change pas d'expression, une expression qui n'affiche rien, un air bovin. « Des paroles à ruminer, hein, » dit Jim. « Toujours des mots à ruminer, rien que des mots. Cette maison, cette vie et cette famille, toutes ces années, j'ai envie de vous tirer dessus juste pour provoquer une réaction de votre part. »« Jim ?» lance sa mère. « Pardon, » dit-il, « tu as raison, tout va bien, tout était bien, vraiment. Vide, mais ce n'est pas grave, je ne, suis pas, je ne sais pas pourquoi ça a cessé d'aller. » C'est juste des mots de tête, dit sa mère. Ouais, et d'autres choses aussi. C'est juste des mots de tête, dit-elle. Il faut que tu ailles te faire opérer des sinus, ou prendre un traitement plus efficace, ou des médicaments pour tes humeurs, quelque chose. Ce n'est qu'un déséquilibre chimique. Un air de sincérité totale sur le visage de sa mère. Elle y croit, dur comme fer, elle veut l'aider. N'est-ce pas notre mère, la dernière personne qui occupera notre esprit jusqu'à juste à la fin Qu'est-ce que... Quelle que soit la fin, pourquoi n'est-elle pas en son pouvoir de faire davantage Pourquoi une famille ne peut-elle pas arrêter le cours des événements ou atteindre quoi que ce soit ?« Je regrette que tu ne puisses pas faire davantage, » dit Jim. « J'aimerais que tu puisses m'aider. J'ai besoin d'aide, vraiment besoin. Je ne trouve plus le chemin du retour et je ne sais pas ce qui s'est passé. »« On est là pour t'aider, » dit Doug. « Comme les arbres. »« Quoi ?»« Les arbres veulent m'aider, eux aussi. » Ils font de leur mieux. Ils ne peuvent pas parler, ils n'ont pas de bras, ils ne peuvent pas se déplacer parce qu'ils n'ont pas de jambes. Mais ils font ce qu'ils peuvent. « C'est les mots de tête, rien d'autre, » dit sa mère. « Ils ne peuvent pas te prescrire quelque chose pour ça ?»« euh, Je prends un traitement pour la dépression ou je ne sais pas quoi, les montagnes russes. Hein, essayer de tout remettre à plat, un manège qui tourne et tourne encore, mais pas besoin de barre de protection car il ne fera jamais de looping ni de rouleau. Il ne prendra jamais de hauteur. »« Comment le docteur peut-il te dire des choses pareilles ?» Il ne m'a pas dit ça, il a juste dit que les médocs allaient faire tout empirer pendant deux semaines, et bonne chance à vous, mon vieux. Mais il n'y a aucune logique dans tout ça, dit-elle. C'est vrai, tu as toujours été si intelligent, si heureux. Je n'étais pas heureux, si, tu l'étais. D'accord, j'étais heureux en permanence. Ne fais pas ça. Faire quoi Parler comme ça. Tu veux dire, être d'accord avec toi Ce n'est pas toi, c'est tout ce qui reste de moi, peu importe ce que c'est. « Qu'ai-je d'autre à appeler moi ?» Elle baisse les yeux, retourne à son évier, plie un petit torchon qu'elle lisse encore et encore avec la paume de sa main, puis avec l'autre, un motif fleuri lui aussi, des fleurs roses, petites et imaginaires, plus parfaites que les vraies, mais fanées par trop de lessive. Elle en trouve les, livres, les lèvres. Euh, « Tu as l'air tellement inquiète, » dit-il. « Eh bien, je le suis. » La respiration de sa mère est lente et laborieuse et son corps tout entier se raidit. Son menton, une sorte de bulbe qui pendouille et qui lui paraît tendu lui aussi. « Je suis désolé, » dit-il. « Rien de tout ça n'est volontaire. Je, je ne cherche pas à vous infliger ça. »« Bien, allons déjeuner, » dit-elle. « Avant que le gibier ne refroidisse, tu peux la porter sur la table. » Jim soulève le plat en céramique jaunie avec son monceau de viande frit dans la chapelure, quelques éclats de croûte sombre, une irriture simple mais bonne et il est prêt à goûter, s'asseoir simplement et manger et discuter et dire des banalités et ne penser à rien. La salle à manger est si petite et le sol recouvert de moquettes, sombre avec ses plafonds bas, une fenêtre derrière ses rideaux donnant sur le lac, un buffet, des assiettes et des couverts brillants, un plateau de photos et de bibelots devant la fenêtre, trop de choses qui encombrent cet endroit. Un guéridon où repose un épais annuaire jaune et le vieux téléphone vert. Une marche pour descendre au salon en passant sous une arche. Une architecture californienne, une petite maison mais avec des arches, comme chez les stars. « Ça a l'air bon, maman !» dit Doug. Et Jim s'est déjà assis, il a un morceau de gibier dans son assiette. 
Il a manqué quelques éléments de transition sans trop savoir ce qui s'est passé. Il voudrait confirmer, mais il ne peut rien dire. Il ne peut que hocher la tête. Les haricots verts, détrempés et mous à côté de la viande et le gratin de pommes de terre recouvert d'une épaisse couche de fromage. « Seigneur, » dit sa mère, les mains jointes en prière, « nous te remercions pour ce repas, pour notre famille à nouveau réunie. Aide mon fils Jim, s'il te plaît. » Aide-le, guide-le, rassure-le et que ton amour soit pour lui une évidence. Aide-nous à traverser ces moments difficiles, je t'en prie Seigneur et merci, Amen. Amen, dit Doug. Jim et son père gardent le silence. Jim n'a même pas pensé à joindre les mains. Tu es croyant, papa demande Jim. As-tu jamais cru euh, Ce n'est pas une question à poser, rétorque sa mère. Non, je veux savoir, papa. Mangeons, dit son père. Est-ce que tu crois en Dieu Est-ce que tu as jamais cru en Dieu Voilà ce que je te demande. Je sais très bien ce que tu demandes. Alors Le fait que tu aies un problème ne veut pas dire que j'en ai un, moi aussi. C'est toi qui m'as fait, il y a bien longtemps. Tu m'as créé et je veux savoir ce qui m'a fait. D'où me vient ce sentiment que je ne suis qu'une merde Ça vient de toi ou, ou, ou de maman « Jim, » dit sa mère, « tu as été à l'église toute ta vie. C'est bien ce que je cherche à dire. Eh bien, à t'entendre, on pourrait penser que c'est une mauvaise chose, comme si on t'avait fait du mal. C'est bien ce que je dis. »« Il faut que tu assumes un peu, » dit Doug. Hein « Tu as fait tes propres choix, trompé ta femme, divorcé, Jeannette, vivre seule, sans voir ta famille et même arrêter d'aller à l'église. Tes choix, c'est ce que je te disais hier. Je ne vais pas à l'église, moi, et je ne culpabilise pas. » Il continue de couper des morceaux de gibier et de manger. Le repas ne s'est pas interrompu. Ils ignorent comment c'est possible. Le couteau et les fourchettes s'activent. Ils sentent le goût du beurre, frit dans le beurre, tout ce qu'ils mangent, même avec la chapelure, le poisson chat, le crapé calico, le crapé arlequin, la truite arc-en-ciel, le gibier. Seuls les oiseaux sont cuisinés différemment, plus ou moins placés tels quels dans le four. Jim mâche et mâche un goût de gibier caoutchouteux, du sang dans le beurre, et il déglutit enfin. Tu as raison, c'est de ma faute. Je pense que c'est bien ça le problème. Le fait que j'ai bousillé ma propre vie me pousse à m'apitoyer sur mon sort et euh, c'est encore plus dangereux, l'auto-apitoiement. Je ne sais pas comment ça fonctionne ni comment y mettre un terme. Je voudrais que ce soit la faute de quelqu'un d'autre parce que là, au moins, je pourrais me battre en m'ayant moi-même pour allier et j'avancerais peut-être enfin quelque part. « Mais comment est-ce que tu peux parler comme ça ?» demande sa mère. « Ça n'a absolument aucun sens. »« Mais si !» Si je ne peux pas me battre pour moi-même, il n'y a pas d'issue possible. Et je ne sais pas pourquoi, mais ça fait très longtemps que je n'y arrive pas. Il te suffit d'arrêter. Oui, c'est ce que dit Doug. Eh bien, il a raison. Non mais ferme là une seconde, je, je réfléchis, j'ai l'impression de tenir quelque chose. Tu dis à ta mère de la fermer, lâche son père, va-t'en tout de suite. Non mais arrêtez d'être mesquin, rien qu'une minute, fermez-la et laissez-moi réfléchir. Jim frôle une idée familière, un élément de vérité qui lui donnerait les moyens de se battre pour lui-même. Une notion spatiale de ce chemin à effectuer à côté de sa propre personne actuelle, juste à sa portée. Quelque chose qu'il peut presque toucher. « Va-t'en !» hurle son père. Et c'est si rare, si incroyablement rare de l'entendre élever la voix, de le voir réagir ou de se préoccuper de quoi que ce soit, qu'il le dévisage simplement tous les trois. « C'est toi, papa euh, ?» dit Jim. « Te voilà enfin, bienvenue dans la famille. La dernière fois qu'on t'a vu, ça remonte à 30 ans. » Son père se redresse et contourne la table plus vite que Jim ne l'aurait imaginé possible, plus leste. Son poing attrape Jim par le col, ses articulations contre sa colonne vertébrale le soulèvent. Il ne résiste pas. Il prend conscience de ses jambes sous lui et on lui fait franchir la cuisine, puis la porte moustiquaire et les marches en ciment lézardées et toujours ce poing qui le pousse en avant vers l'allée en direction de la route. « Si Brûlante en été comme un four, tant d'années de souvenirs sur ce ciment, à présent froid et trempé, et son père s'arrête à l'instant où les bottes de Jim heurtent le porti, la portion de terre et de gravillon. Son père le lâche alors et se rend au portail. Il le ferme d'un geste ample, un portail aussi large que l'allée entière jamais utilisée, et Jim en avait même oublié l'existence. Mais le voilà de l'autre côté. Le portail le coupe de l'allée et la haie le coupe de la pelouse. Un petit no man's land avant la route. Il ne s'était jamais rendu compte, jusqu'à aujourd'hui, que cette parcelle de manœuvre ne faisait peut-être pas partie de leur maison. Chaque fois qu'il y jouait, enfant, il était en territoire étranger, sans même le savoir. Et il aurait pu s'y perdre. Son père ne s'est pas arrêté pour lui parler. Il est déjà rentré. Aucune surprise sur ce point.
You could understand this, right? Because of yeah, your... Yeah. yeah, I understood most of it. It's the easiest French for me to understand, the words that I wrote. Yeah. <laughs> now... Yeah, um, great, great reading. All yeah. the different voices and everything. I could see it. Um, Jim is, is still trying to figure out, I find in this fact fragment, why he's feeling as bad as he does. So he's depressed and he, he wants to know why that is. is that, was the book also for you a way to find that out still after all these years, trying to find answers? Yeah, uh, like Jim, j'ai besoin d'un instant pour réfléchir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's true, I, I was still trying to find out. Um, I couldn't answer the question, I still can't, of, uh, what he brings up, what makes him feel like a piece of shit and why he spiraled into self-pity uh, so much. And uh, it seems it's possible that it's religion, uh, that he was always such a good boy, uh, worked his way through high school at Safeway, um, never caused any problems, never drank, never did anything bad, um, but then felt that he, he didn't believe and he, um, in his sexual desires and uh, other things he wanted to do in his life, he didn't fit within who he was supposed to be. Uh, he didn't want to stay married. He, you know, left his wife and kids. Um, so uh, I think it's possible that that guilt uh, and the, his Christian background could have been part of it, but I, I, I don't really know. Uh, so it's all an open question. When I was writing the book, I actually didn't know anything. Uh, it's all just being explored, and there's no plan or outline when I'm writing. I have no idea what will happen exactly. Uh, so um, the, the situations, the scenes just took off. It was whatever the character would say leads to what the next character says. And, and then the feeling about it, there's some vision you know, that he might have with the, the sweater and blouse and green beans and such. Like, those are the kind of crazy moments that I look for in the writing, the moments of vision and, and, and strangeness. Um, it's usually in uh, looking at landscape in my books. I, since I write without a plan or an outline, I find the story through describing the place. And my books are all set in these natural landscapes. And there are plenty of examples in this book, too, uh, where he's looking at, at, the, at the tree and at stone and the little growth on them and wondering why the, the tree has a skin and does the sky have a skin. And it, it's, uh, it's all like a Rorschach test, uh, which is also mentioned in the book. Like in psychology, when you put ink on paper and smash it together, it makes random design. If you have someone look at it, they don't say it's a random design. They say, it reminds me of my grandmother's house when we used to go... Uh, so, uh, basically, nature is like a form of the unconscious, uh, especially the ocean, water, because it's never the same from moment to moment. So you can see any pattern in it. You can find yourself. And the, the tradition I write out of in American uh, writing is one that's rural and regional and focused on the landscape. And we describe the inside life of the characters indirectly through describing the place. But it's not just natural landscapes that work that way. It's also all the stuff of a life, like sweaters and blouses and green beans. They can become a kind of landscape that can also change and transform and become odd. So I, I didn't know anything, and I still don't know anything. I haven't really learned much from writing my books. Mm. I've just had lots of strange moments of possibility and vision uh, within them. Yeah, you actually, I think towards the end of the book, you say that maybe he wanted to erase his memories is, is something which is in the book. Eh? This, that this is what maybe Jim wanted. And coming back to what you say about nature, it's obvious that your characters are attracted to nature, but it's not necessarily a place where they find comfort or solace, right? It's, very, it's often, especially in this book, a very upsetting place, nature, I find. Yeah, there's this big tradition from the British Romantic poets, from Wordsworth and Coleridge and through the American transcendentalists with uh, Thoreau and Emerson and Walden Pond, for instance, uh, that we have a sense of uh, nature writing and a focus on the natural landscape as a way to go back to our innocence, to Blake's mind of innocence instead of mind of experience, that we'll find our child self, our genial springs. And so Americans really believe this. Americans have this unshakable belief that they're good, uh, despite all the evidence to the contrary. They even believe the American military is good. And nature is like the bank of our goodness with our westward movement and our sense of entitlement to the place and the idea that we're still living a frontier life somehow. 
uh, that if we go into nature and we have to support ourselves, we'll find that we're resourceful and we're good and we can make it. And uh, right, nature doesn't work that way in any of my books. It just works as a mirror. It's just the Rorschach mm -hmm. test. So if what's going on inside is terrifying, then what you see mirrored back in nature is terrifying. You, you see your terrifying self. And so my books are... Um, in some reviews, they were saying my books are anti-American for that reason, mm. just that, that because they don't look at nature as the, the place of your goodness and innocence. Um, all of that is a desire to return to the Garden of Eden is what it is. It's very simple. The entire romantic movement is just trying to return to the garden, to our innocence, which, of course, you can't do. Unfortunately, we're, uh, we're spoiled, especially as adults. Mm. <laughs> We've become something else. Mm. Have you been afraid that you might resemble him? Yeah, for uh, 22 years, I really was afraid I would kill myself, uh, not because I had any suicidal thoughts, but because it felt like doom, like it was something waiting for me, that because he had done it, I would hit some low point in my life and it would just be there, inevitable and, and not something I could resist, that it would just be waiting for me. Uh, and I hit a really low point in my life, kind of repeating his life. I went to Uh, he was a dentist but wanted to be a fisherman, so he had a boat built and went to sea, and it was disastrous. And I went to sea with boats, and I'm still doing it even this last year, new disasters. But anyway, <laughs> I don't learn. <laughs> but um, So I'd, I'd lost everything. I'd lost my business, my home. Like People were after me. I had no job, no future to look forward to. And after a few days of this really low place, I realized I hadn't had a single thought about suicide. My brain just doesn't go there just not wired that way. It turns out mental illness is not hereditary. Um, it's really not. Like in all studies, it doesn't pass down. It's, it's something that happens to us um, in our lives through everything that we experience. So um, yeah, uh, I now I'm not afraid of that anymore. But um, he's still affecting my life uh, with boats, with uh, distance from other people, with uh, perhaps my divorce. Uh, with not having kids, um, you know, all these deep kind of ways that I don't understand. I mean, I'm not just writing Greek tragedy, I'm living it. So, you know, it's, a, it's very authentic in that way. My life is led very unconsciously and out of control, just like the lives of all my characters. The reason I love Greek tragedy is that the characters are not enemies. They just are acting unconsciously and out of control, so they end up hurting the people they love. Mm. Um, and that's to me the, the mystery of Greek tragedy. Why do we hurt the people we love? And in the scene that you heard, it's clear he's hurting his family terribly. He loves them and he doesn't want to hurt them, but just because of who he is and where he's at in his life then, he's hurting them terribly. And they're hurting him also, but they never intended to do that. Uh, it's so much more interesting, Greek tragedy, that the characters not enemies, they're family who love each other, instead of having bad guys from outside, you know, come shoot people up like... It's just not interesting from the outside. Yeah. Now, um, well, as you mentioned, weapons and guns. For me, I know, of course, that you've written these books about uh, that you've grown up in a in a well in a milieu which is violent. You went hunting with your with your family, etc. But still, the moment that I realized that he went to the psychiatrist and he had he was carrying a gun, Jim Van, and then he's staying at his brother's house. There are guns there. This for for us European readers, this is so weird and also shocking that these. Guns are available. There are so many guns in the book, and he's suicidal, which everyone in the book knows. How is that even possible? That's strange. Yeah, there's so many guns. There are always so many guns in every house. So after my dad killed himself with a pistol, my family thought it would be a great idea to give me all of his guns. Mm. So in my closet, I had not just a rifle, like 30-30 rifle, like in the Westerns, but also his 300 Magnum rifle for bears. And I used it to shoot out street lamps in our neighborhood and to aim at my neighbors. I'm aiming at them with something that can kill a bear with the shell in the chamber and the safety off, just one little tap. You know, a 13-year-old boy, because that makes sense. And I had two shotguns, you know, like a 12-gauge, like police use. Um, um, yeah. How do you look back on that, well, <laughs> time, what, you know, with hunting and, and this, this childhood and, and adolescence with guns? How do you look back on that time? Uh... The good part is that uh, we grew up in beautiful places in Alaska and California. We hiked off trail, and because we were hunting for things, we went to places you wouldn't normally go, and we saw lots of beautiful places. And it became what my love is of nature, of, of going hiking, of sailing, scuba diving, was really the foundation was that, the hunting and fishing. Um, and it was a way for my family to be together 
for the men in my family. And it also went back to our Cherokee Native American heritage uh, that the men in my family were not uh, comfortable socially and actually were kind of anti-American in their views and, and uh, really only felt at home when they're out in a natural landscape and with each other and not saying anything. Uh, so it was a kind of safe place, and and our, my most positive memories with my father are there. Uh, but of course, I think the U.S. is insane for its lack of gun control. We're actually a domestic war zone every year with 30,000 gun deaths a year and about 100,000 wounded. And we destroyed our neighbor Mexico by buying their drugs and selling guns to them at gun shows. So they have 13,000 gun deaths a year. Uh, it is absolutely insane, and, and it won't improve. It can only get worse because there was a de Supreme Court decision in 2008 that blocked any gun laws, and now the Trump has appointed two conservative justices for the Supreme Court, which means for, like, for the next, and they're young enough, for the next decades, uh, there's no hope at all. So uh, the U.S. is crazy and out of control and dangerous, and, and I hope that you know, Europe does everything possible to contain it. Um, but it's hard to contain, especially with the wild man at the helm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I also write novels, so I, was, I know how, it, how hard it is sometimes to, to enter a character's mind, especially when, the, when that mind is a very dark place. And of course, this was not just a dark mind, but also someone who was in some way, not 100% your father, but at least inspired by him. Was this the most challenging book to write for you? Was it especially difficult? Because I find reading sometimes some of these sections where he's like ranting and ranting and going on like, whoa, this is very dark material. How was that for you? It was really difficult, honestly. It was uh, took me twice as long as writing any of the other novels. I mean, my first one about him, Suquan Island, um, or Legend of the Suicide, took 10 years, but it was writing lots of things, learning to write, throwing stuff away. Suquan Island that I actually kept, I wrote half of it in 17 days, sailing California to Hawaii, and wrote the rest in maybe six weeks. So everything I actually published, I wrote quickly. This was the slowest, uh, twice as long as any of the others, because I was suffering as I was going through it. I, I, um, I didn't want to know about some of it or think about it. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, um, I do have this feeling that the reader's not going to feel anything that's not actually experienced by the author. I think a book's only affecting if it, if it had all those effects on the author as they're writing it. And I think that books have to be real, not faked. That the unconscious transformations, the surprises and visions have to be real ones that are discovered in the writing, not anything planned or staged or, oh, it'd be a cool idea if he thought this or did this. So, so it all actually happened, and it was disturbing. Um, I didn't like it, and I, I'm not going to write... Uh, something like it again, I don't think. Um. Yeah, but the, the chronology of the book, which is like his last three or four days, I think, was that also which resembled a real chronology, or were you not after that? It's close in that he did have a trip to all the family at the end before going back up to Alaska. Um, but I didn't, I have in the Dutch edition that it's framed by short stories, and one of them is the Sheriff's Department Incident Report, which is the actual report of what happened. And if you read that and compare it to the rest, you'll see that some of the events are off. You know, he's supposed to go jogging at some point, he saw some other therapist at some point, and, and they had different phone calls, different timing. So I didn't make any effort at all to follow the script of what exactly happened. I was just trying to discover and invent and find out what would happen on the page, roughly following that he saw everyone. But all the all the interactions, all the conversations, they're all invented. It's not what happened. And I wasn't there. I was 13 years old, and I wasn't there for most of it. And so I don't know. And I didn't interview family to try to figure it out either. I don't really care about what their, their version of it was. Because after his suicide, we all had such different versions. Because we're all driven by rage and guilt and shame. So we're all liars. I mean, you hear any of my family's versions of things, and you think, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> really? <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, um, it wasn't an attempt to be accurate. Yeah, and what were the big surprises that you okay, um, that, that happened while you were writing? Uh, I guess one surprise was to just uh, feel how far gone he is. It's a strange thing that my love for him is frozen from when I'm 13 years old. So we just had the anniversary of his suicide, March 15th. I still feel like so sad and that I miss him so much on that day every year. And my sadness for him is like a kid's sadness, like it's frozen. 
Um, but then uh, I can't remember him. I can't remember him speaking and moving, talking and walking. Like, uh, so I've lost him in that way. So it's such a strange thing. I've, he's still there and very present and strong, and he's also completely gone. And I put in the author's note, it's, uh, suicide bereavement is like a, a conversation that goes on forever with no one. And it's, it's a strange thing. Yeah. And my sister goes through it too. Yeah, yeah. I, w I really wanted to ask you about that quote that you just gave me, which is actually what this book is, a, a conversation with, with a person who's gone, right? Um, I was also thinking that, well, I find that your books, I was thinking about the difference between memoir and, and novels. And I think that memoirs allow for more chaos. For instance, you can have, you know, when a person gets married seven times in a memoir, it's normal. But in a novel, someone would say, well, maybe that's a bit much. Or also in a memoir, people, sometimes there are two people who are called Mark because that's what happens in families. And I find that your books are so, like kind of hybrid between the two genres because, well, in the novel, there are two characters with the same name, but also, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like life, but it's not like life. H how do you feel about this? Yeah, I think... Um I'm different than European writers in that I, I want people to know the true story behind all of my fictions because then they can see what the transformations were. If you know what the true story was, then you can see the parts where it depart, the places where it departs from that, becomes something else. And that's the whole point of what the writing is doing. I think writing is all about those transformations, those surprises. So I want everyone to know as much as possible what the true story is. And in this, I go, went ahead and used my father's real name and my name. And in the French and Dutch editions, you actually have my uncle's real name and stuff. We changed them in English. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to be as close as possible to that so that uh, all the moments that depart are the things that actually uh, say something. Um, uh, I don't know, that's a little hard to explain maybe, but, but uh, yeah, I've never felt this need to hide the, the mm -hmm. sources of the fiction. Um, it's not memoir in that character and event have changed and, and it's not accurate and it's not, um, it's not as careful as memoir needs to be. I've written two sailing memoirs and a nonfiction book about a school shooting which had my own growing up with guns as a memoir included in it. And I don't think I'll ever write nonfiction again because I really, I need to have that freedom for the, for the events to surprise me and go off some different direction and for the character to become different than I first imagined them. Um, so I need, I need that freedom, but I also, my books are heavily influenced by my life and my family, most mm -hmm. of them. Not the one about Medea, Bright or Black, or Aquarium, which has nothing to do with my family. But all the rest um, draw on that material and are trying to understand it obliquely, you know, from the side. And those two me novels you just mentioned now, Aquarium and the other one, do you approach the writing then in a different way? Because they are not inspired by your family's history? Well, Brighter Black was right in sequence with my other books. It's about religion, about Greek and Egyptian gods. What holds all of my books together is they're all about religion. So Suquan Island starts with rewrite of Genesis. It's doom and Anglo-Saxons in Caribou Island, New Age movement in Ampur, um, the Holy Trinity showing up in odd form in Goat Mountain, which is also a version of hell, that book, and, and my best book in that way, because uh, that's the natural goal of someone who writes tragedy is to write that tragedy is about our badness, some landscape of that, and hell is the landscape of badness, like fully developed. Um, and then uh, Bright Air Black followed. I wrote it right after Goat Mountain, and it continues with Greek and Egyptian gods, the earliest, earliest uh, chthonic gods, like from the earth, naming the sun a god and earth and such. Um, and uh, it yeah, although it obviously has nothing to do with my family from 3,250 years ago, mm -hmm. it uh, uh, followed the archaeological evidence and tried to make Medea a real person and tried to imagine real tragedy. So it actually fits, but Aquarium's not a tragedy by the end, nothing to do with my family, a very generous main character, and, and that really is a, completely apart from my other books. All my other books fit together and could be read as one book, mm -hmm. but not that one. Okay, yeah. Um, I was also thinking about uh, Legend of a Suicide again, and I was rereading some things about that, and I had forgotten that it had been sitting in a drawer for 10 years, right? Before someone wanted to publish it. This is... or Well, I waited or 12, 12 years. years. Yeah. And no agent or editor ever agreed to publish it, actually. I just sent it to a contest. It won the contest. And they had to publish whatever won the contest. 
So that's the only way it got published. Yeah, but that's, that's ha that must have affected you because you were waiting so long. Were you writing still at that time? Yeah, so, I mean, I didn't write for about six years of it because I went to sea and I was a captain on boats and I mm. couldn't write because I was having lots of disasters at sea, including sinking and and such. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that book, it's a mile down, the true story of a disastrous career at sea, and it doesn't skimp on disaster. It's got like 90 pages of storm and sinking scenes. <laughs> um Uh, what was I saying? Uh, we were talking about uh, how long it was before Legend of a Suicide. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I was writing during that time, but um, it, it had some strange effects. Not, I worked on the book for 10 years and then took 12 years before it got published. So it's 22 years. Mm. I never imagined an audience, for instance. I, I didn't have an audience for 22 years. So still in my mind, when I write my books, I'm just writing them for me. I'm trying to make them beautiful and true. And I, I don't really care like what a reader's going to experience. Um, I think that I do without knowing about it. I think that I'm shaping it, I'm thinking about timing and such from everything I've read and when I studied creative writing and such um, in a way that's trying to make it readable. But I'm never consciously aware of that. I don't actually think of what a reader is um, um, because I was alone in the writing for so long. And may still be. People may just stop by my books. I'm still going to write. <laughs> so we may hit a 22-year period later in my life when, again, I have no audience, but I'm still writing the books. So that's entirely possible. Are you worried about that? <laughs> I am in some places, uh, not for French or Dutch editions, mm. uh, because those, I have fabulous publishers and they're really great reading cultures where there's independent booksellers all throughout France, for instance, and Belgium and Switzerland and French Canada. And there's all these great festivals and such uh, in the Netherlands. So it's, it's a, uh, uh, these are really strong literary cultures where I have no doubt all of my books will come out. Um, and for the rest of my life, I'll be visiting and very happy to come to festivals and do book <laughs> tours. But in the U.S., it could be this is my last book that I never get published again there. It's always a possibility there. It doesn't matter how many prizes you've won or if the books have sold before. Or if they don't keep selling, it's all just a machine about sales mm. in the worst possible sales environment where you don't have any independent booksellers or very few anymore who care about books, who would encourage people to read literary fiction. And I don't tend to write like, you know, happy books that make you feel good about yourself and the characters. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And my publisher, also my U.S. editor, the truth is she doesn't like my writing. And <laughs> she wants to cut all the moments that are most important, all the moments that are vision, you know, that are about religion or that, that have like some moment where I discovered something. It's the reason I wrote the book. She wants to cut all those. And she has a really like, like, kind of mean, snotty attitude about to it in her comments. Like, do we really have to have this? Well, yeah, that's what the fucking book's about, you know? Yeah. Maybe you need a new publisher. Yeah. No, she's like mm. best friends with my agent, so... Okay. I, I, think, I think I'm going to be with her forever, but, you know, one of my novels, it's about my divorce, and she threatened to publish it in the, the erotica collection. I'm like, she's translating Latin in the book. Like, it's a literary novel. Like, yeah. Erotica collection? Really? <laughs> And the books are skipped and published out of order because she just embarrassed and didn't want mm. some of my books. And, mm. you know, this one's published without the stories. And, God, it's such a nightmare. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, we're going to listen to another section from the book. And this is uh, the part, actually, where towards the end of the, of the novel, um, Jim has visited his psychiatrist and he comes out of the office of this psychiatrist and he says that, well, he has some kind of breakthrough and he can even convince his brother that he's feeling better and that he can cope and that he can go back to Alaska on his own. So this is the section. <coughs> Apparemment, le mieux sera un restaurant italien, juste à côté d'ici. Ils y vont et l'endroit est immense. Un bus s'est garé devant. C'est le genre de coin où se retrouvent les cars de touristes et les élèves de terminal avant le bal de promo. Des housses satinées sur les chaises, des rubans et des nœuds partout. Un cochon habillé en princesse. Ah, ça a l'air bien, dit Doug. Et Jim se demande s'il est aveugle à ce point. Super, dit-il. Et il sait déjà qu'ils vont commander le poulet au parmesan, ce qui doit correspondre à 60% de commandes ici. Mais inutile de se montrer grognon. Le dernier repas, ou alors le dernier dîner, soudain il a oublié. La scène, son cerveau ne fonctionne plus. 
On les installe près d'une famille nombreuse dont les enfants grimpent sur l'étape pour mieux s'empoigner et crient. « Eh ben, putain, » dit Jim. Euh, « On peut aller dans un endroit plus calme, hein, si tu préfères, » dit Doug, presque inaudible. Jim secoue la tête, il ne peut pas crier et c'est peut-être mieux comme ça, ne pas être obligé de parler à la fin. Ça semble parfait même, que tout soit étouffé par les sons les plus idiots. Il lit le menu et se décide pour un poulet cacciatore au lieu de parmesan. « Du vin ?» crie Doug. Jim secoue à nouveau la tête, il n'a jamais aimé l'alcool. Bon, il n'a jamais aimé ce qu'aiment la plupart des gens, sauf le sexe. Doug se lève. « On dégage. » dit-il en montrant la porte. Il décoche un regard à la famille qui ne remarque rien, évidemment, et puis ils sont dehors, près du bus, dont le moteur tourne encore, enveloppé d'un nuage de gaz d'échappement. Et Doug observe la rue, à gauche et à droite. « Un resto à burger, dit-il. Parfait. »« Très chic, » dit Jim. Il remonte une portion du trottoir sans éclairage, rien qu'un bout d'asphalte longeant un bâtiment en construction, le genre d'endroit où il est très possible de se faire dépouiller en ville. Et Jim aimerait que cela se produise, mais ils atteignent le restaurant sans encombre, une vieille structure qui pue la friture. Le menu est écrit sur le mur au-dessus du comptoir, le burger à bacon, enfin. Jim éprouve une joie momentanée. Euh, une portion supplémentaire de sauce barbecue dit-il, et euh, le bacon aussi. « Un pareil pour moi, » dit Doug, « ça me paraît bien, et un milkshake au chocolat. »« Ouais, un banane euh, chocolat au lait malté pour moi, » dit Jim. « Ouais, changez ma commande, je prends ça aussi. » Le type au comptoir ne décroche pas le moindre mot, rien qu'au hanchement de tête, et le total qui apparaît sur la caisse enregistreuse. Jim paie, et on lui tend un numéro sur une plaquette en métal. Il s'installe à une table dans un coin, serré euh, contre d'autres clients. Une peinture bleue, très épaisse, et le sol en ciment de la même teinte bleue. C'est comme si quelqu'un s'était contenté d'attraper un pot de peinture et de le jeter dans la salle. « Tu sais où emmener une nana, hein, toi ?» dit Jim. « Doux gris, ouais, c'est plutôt sympa, hein, ça valait la peine de faire tout ce chemin. » Jim sourit. « Et je suis content de te retrouver, » dit Doug. « C'est agréable de voir un sourire. » Alors Jim sait qu'il ne faut pas en faire trop. Ça risquerait d'éveiller les soupçons. Il éprouve une vraie terreur à l'idée de ce qu'il doit dire ensuite. Comment combler le temps entre maintenant et le départ de Doug Et après ça, il va baiser. Il va trouver une prostituée. « Tu as prévu de faire quoi à ton retour à Fairbanks ?» Doug semble tellement plein d'espoir. Il a l'air de penser que Jim a pris un virage et c'est l'appel du pied parfait pour un menteur. Les projets peuvent se développer de façon exponentielle et n'ont jamais besoin de preuves concrètes. Euh, « Je vais me remettre à la natation, » dit Jim, « à la piscine de l'université. Ça me détend toujours et je vais prendre des cours de plongeon de haut vol. J'ai vu qu'ils en proposaient apprendre à plonger correctement. Oh, ça m'a l'air super. Ouais. Et faire plus de ski de fond sur les pistes de l'université. Ce qu'il y a de bien à Fairbanks, c'est la quantité de soleil qu'on peut avoir en hiver. Il fait froid, mais il y a presque toujours du soleil, alors la plupart des journées sont idéales pour skier. Il va ajouter que Doug devrait passer voir ça de ses propres yeux, mais il se rend compte que c'est une erreur. Il ne peut pas donner à Doug des occasions de venir. « Mais ça me paraît très positif tout ça, » dit Doug. « T'occuper et profiter des bons coins aux côtés de l'Alaska. »« Ouais, il ah, y a un truc qui me branche... » Il y a une place qui s'est libérée dans un quatuor barbershop a cappella. Ah bah oui, tu adorerais ça Ouais, ça fait tellement longtemps que ça me tente et j'aime vraiment bien. J'ai joué un peu de trompette dans le théâtre local et ça commence à remonter la dernière fois que j'ai fait de la scène. Hein, tu pourrais porter un chapeau de paille, un veston à rayures rouges et blanches. Ouais, un des membres est un docteur que je connais. Bon, Jim tire un peu sur la corde. Ils ont fait en sorte de ne pas se faire d'amis là-bas et Doug s'en souvient peut-être. Mais Doug ne relève pas et leur commande arrive rapidement. Les milkshakes, bananes, chocolat si bons qu'ils ne peuvent rien faire d'autre que pousser un gémissement. Les burgers déborgent de, de bacon et de sauce barbecue, la totale, servie avec des beignets d'oignons. Jim prend une énorme bouchée, il ferme les yeux et songe à cette solution qui s'offre à lui. Qui à lui pardon. Se contenter des plaisirs ordinaires. On n'appuie pas sur la détente quand on a la bouche pleine de bacon. Personne ne ferait une chose pareille. « Ce bacon » dit-il. « Ce bacon !»« Ouais 
C'est quoi les meilleures choses que tu aies connues dans ta vie Ce que tu as le plus apprécié Alors Doug ouvre les yeux et la bouche pleine, il dit « Putain, c'est bon !» Jim attend qu'il ait fini de mâcher. « Eh bien, dit Doug, le ski nautique, de grande vitesse. J'étais terrifié et je me suis arrêté tout de suite, mais j'ai vraiment apprécié. Ouais. Le hors-bord allait à combien À 140. Oh, bordel de merde et le basket, j'ai toujours adoré le basket, je ne sais pas trop pourquoi, faire partie d'une équipe sans doute. Nos meilleures expériences se font au sein d'un groupe ou d'une équipe. Ouais, bon, j'ai pas très connu ça. T'as loupé quelque chose alors Jim y songe un moment, une vie isolée. Comment a-t-il pu rater les expériences de groupe Il n'a jamais accordé la moindre importance aux activités sociales. Et euh, notre entreprise de pêche professionnelle aussi, continue Doug. C'était vraiment un sacré truc. Hein, construire le bateau, passer du temps en mer. Merci. Ouais, c'était super. Et euh, je sais pas quoi d'autre. Pour le sexe, bien sûr, mais ça figure en haut de la liste pour euh, tous les hommes. La nourriture, parfois. Les quantités d'hormones qu'on a pu manger. Ils vont devenir de plus en plus rares. Jim voit qu'il a vécu une belle vie, riche en expérience. Il a eu tout ce qu'avait eu Doug, sauf euh, le sport et la vie sociale. Mais à l'inverse, il a eu plus d'argent et d'opportunités. Il n'a pas vraiment fait bon usage, ou alors ça ne lui a pas suffi. Et pourquoi Mystère. La consistance granuleuse du lait malté dans le milkshake au chocolat, un plaisir qui devrait à lui seul suffire. Des bananes bien mûres. Son frère qu'il aime, qui est heureux et soulagé de voir que Jim va bien, si confiant, si simple. Ils terminent leur burger et leur milkshake et ils restent assis là à un moment comme étourdi. On sert d'autres burgers aux clients voisins et il a beau avoir trop mangé, il les trouve pourtant appétissants. « Bon, » dit Jim, « tu devrais peut-être y aller pour ne pas rentrer trop tard. »« Ouais, » dit Doug, « t'es sûr que ça va aller ?»« Ouais, ça va maintenant. »« Ça ne me dérange pas de venir quelques jours avec toi juste pour être sûr que ça va. »« Je sais, je t'en suis reconnaissant, mais ce n'est pas la peine, je vais bien. » Je viens juste de savourer un bon burger et un milkshake avec mon frère. Je me sens euh, normal. J'ai hâte de me mettre à toutes ces activités, à faire bang. Je repense à ce que tu m'as dit sur le basket. C'est quoi tu heures Barbershop, c'est l'occasion de me faire un nouveau groupe d'amis. et Je vais en profiter, hein, voir ce que je peux faire d'autre. Tu es sur la bonne voie, ça t'apportera beaucoup de choses. Ouais, je le pense aussi. Jim Akies frappe la table de ses articulations, puis il se lève. Ils émergent de l'univers bleu du restaurant, longent le site de construction merdique. Jim guette les éventuels prostituées, mais il n'en voit pas encore. Il va devoir demander au portier ou au groom. En quelques instants, ils sont dans le parking de l'hôtel près du pick-up de Doug. Les derniers moments de Jim avec son frère. Il éprouve une tristesse débordante et un sentiment de perte inexprimable. Alors il sourit et le serre dans ses bras. « Merci, Frangin. » dit-il. « Merci d'en avoir fait autant pour moi. »« Eh, c'est normal, » dit Doug. « Je suis juste content de te retrouver. »« Viens pêcher en Alaska cet été. J'ai entendu parler de nouveaux coins dans la rivière pour choper les saumons king. »« Ah bon Dieu, j'aimerais tellement. »« Mais j'ai pas d'argent et je pense qu'on va faire ce voyage en voiture pour trouver un autre endroit où vivre. »« Je paierai vos billets. »« Réfléchis-y. »« Pêcher un saumon royal de 30 kilos dans une rivière, le plus gros que tu t'aies jamais vu. » Doug éclate de rire. « Ça fait bien envie. » Puis il remonte dans son pick-up et démarre et baisse la vitre pour lui adresser un salut et il disparaît. La dernière corde de sécurité de Jim, les derniers instants en compagnie d'une personne qui tient à lui, seul à présent, mais plus obligé de sourire, plus obligé de mentir. Il va baiser jusqu'à l'épuisement, puis il appuiera sur la détente et il en finira. Que cette vie aille se faire foutre. Okay, we have to, um, well, almost finish this uh, interview. Um, having talked to you, I have the impression that this, well, this having uh, writing this book hasn't exactly brought you peace of mind or anything like that. But has it brought you anything? No, I'm totally enlightened now and, and <laughs> all is resolved. No, but yeah, what has it done or what has it changed? Or um, Well, uh, I think... Uh, The reason we write and read tragedy is that we get a chance to look at what's bad or uh, upsetting or terrifying or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, 
And it's a safe place to look at it. It's meaningful and coherent in a way that real life was not. And uh, it, yeah, it helps manage it for us. So uh, for me, his story and the end of it, uh, all of it does feel more resolved, uh, more manageable uh, to think about and to feel after having written it. Um, I think it's, that's the kind of peace of mind that it provides. And, and to explore possibility, like the possibility of whether he could, he could have been capable of killing one or some of us before killing himself. Um, you know, that question is put to rest more in my mind. Mm. And uh, also guilt. Uh, that's what I wanted. I wanted to think about guilt more. And it was interesting to see that in a scene with his father, he has a scene later with his father where his father tells him quite a lot and really tries to help him. And it still doesn't help him uh, to see uh, uh, the limits of what you can do for someone. I think I do feel better in that way. But I, of course, don't want my books just to be therapy. The, the mm. difference, they are wonderful therapy. Uh, they're very cathartic. And, um, but the difference is that they have an aesthetic goal. You know, they're trying to create the beautiful and they're trying to be uh, coherent and meaningful and have some sort of vision. And that's not the goal in therapy. So, um, you know, I hope they, I hope it has a life outside of what it did mm. for me. Of course, it's a combination, I think, of the two, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation. And uh, you can buy David's books uh, here in the foyer. And he will also be signing them and you can talk to him. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.